Hello and welcome to the Caledonia Crime Collective Tour Bus. We are here on tour courtesy of the brilliant UK Crime Book Club. Here's the van, bright red CCC van. I'm Emma Christie. I'm one member of the Caledonia Crime Collective and now we're going to step inside our tour bus and do an amazing tour of Scottish crime fiction. So just get inside the van. <laughs> we will start the tour by introducing the members of the CCC, starting with Marion Todd. Hello! Very excited to be on this tour tonight. Uh, just put my seatbelt on and we're all ready to go. Excellent. Glad to, I was about to say, have you got your seatbelt on? We Thanks. also will be joined by... Deborah Masson, who will be um, in Aberdeen, but actually uh, Marion's going to uh, take her seat. Uh, then we'll go up to Inverness. We're going to be joined by Gareth Halliday. And after that, we're going to zip across to John Blaine and meet Andy Greg. Here he Here is. Here I am. Hello, Zooming everyone. In. Looking forward and to this. We Excellent. Then we've got uh, Alan Martin a little bit further down. Hi there. I'm here. Just north of Glasgow. And last but not least, we will be finishing up this tour of Scotland and Glasgow with the one and only Jonathan Whitelaw. Hello, everybody. Excellent. So now we're, everyone's got their seat on the bus. Everyone got their seat belts on. Do you all trust my driving? Absolutely. We Another do. question. Excellent. So let's start this brilliant CCC Caledonia Crime Collective tour of Scotland. Brilliant. Okay, yeah. so we're starting in uh, Edinburgh, where my novels are set, but we're not going to talk about them at the moment, because I think we probably all know Edinburgh. Let's get on the bus and get up the road. We're going to head to Fife the kingdom of Fife and in the kingdom there is not a king but a queen of crime fiction and her name is Marion Todd so we're going to cross the bridges the magnificent bridges uh, just outside Edinburgh where once many months ago I pushed a potato across the fourth road bridge with my nose to raise money for charity long story my wrists have never been the same um, and we're over the bridges we're into Fife and our local guide the magnificent Crime writer Marion Todd will take over the microphone. Excellent. So we're now in the Kingdom of Fife. St Andrews is towards the, the top of Fife and, and we're entering from the, the south, I should say north. Um, there's various ways you can go. You can take the boring motorway, which is very fast. You can take the sort of cross-country route, but I like to go round by all the, the kind of little seaside towns like Burnt Island and Aberdour and Kinghorn and round the East Nuke, which is the name for um, a part of Fife where there are lots of fishing villages. So we go round by that and then we start heading north and as we approach St Andrews, no matter which road you come in from, from the south, there's three different roads, uh, you have an elevated position and you're looking down on the town. And the thing that stands out is, first of all, that you have the North Sea on your, your <clears throat> right hand side on the east um, with the East Sands, which is one of the small, the two beaches in St Andrews. It's the smaller of the two. And in the distance, you can see a very tall St Rule's Tower, which is in the grounds of the ancient cathedral, which dates back to the 14th century. The important thing about the East Sands, and this is very important, so don't miss this, is the cheesy toast shack. I have to say, the best toasty I have ever had. They're the size of a house brick, so delicious. Um, if you're a macaroni cheese fan, they do a macaroni cheese toasty. So we're quite hungry after our journey up from Edinburgh, um, so grab yourself a cheesy toasty head along the east sands for a little bit of a walk cross the bridge at the small harbour and you're into the main part of st andrews if you pass the ruined cathedral and st rule's tower the first of three main streets you come to is south street they're called in this order south street and then market street and then no prizes north street um south street is is a lovely kind of leafy um street shops on one side and lovely buildings on the other um with lime trees along to give you shade in the summer and towards the west end of south street there's the ancient westport gate 
um, which I've mentioned a few times in my novels, just to prove that we are in St Andrews. The next street up, Market Street, is is a bit, you know, it's got lots of shops and things. That's fine if you like that kind of thing. But we're going to go round to North Street, where um, lots of the university buildings are. St Andrews uh, has one of the oldest universities. It's actually the third oldest English-speaking university in the world after Oxford and Cambridge. But it's not a campus university as such because it's quite a small town and the buildings are scattered throughout the town. So when nice buildings have come up for sale, the university mm -hmm. has bought them. So you might have something that looks like someone's house, but it's actually the Department of Geography or, or that kind of thing. Um, in fact, the one I would recommend that you have a look at is down on the, the final street, which is quaintly called The Scores. And that's the Department of Economics. It is a beautiful building. And next door to that is the ruined St Andrew's Castle, which is something to behold. It's, I think it's a historic Scotland or National mm -hmm. Trust um, monument. You can go around that. And as you walk down the scores, you might wish to look at the houses and things and the buildings that are there and reflect that it's Scotland's eighth most expensive street. Lots of statistics today. I've been mugging up for this this tour. I hope I get brownie points for this. Um, it lots of people at uh, university have lots of buildings. So it's lots of bed and breakfasts and small hotels. And then on the corner of the scores is um, a very iconic building which you'll see from the other direction in St Andrews called Hamilton Grand. And I think it's something. I think the rooftop uh, penthouse suite is several million pounds, which in Scotland is a lot of money for a property. Um, as you come to the end of the scores and you have this, this expensive property on your left, if you look out, you'll see the West Sands, which is a much lar larger and longer beach that um, goes right down to Eden Estuary, which is a bird reserve. And behind the West Sands, there's um, like a putting green, I think. It's, it's where they maybe play golf or something like that. Um, possibly the oldest... Um, the oldest course in the world, the, one of the oldest, the best known anyway, the old course in St Andrews, um, next to the old horse, course hotel. Um, but they do actually have a putting green and it's called the Himalayas, so called because it's a very bumpy course and um, it's, it's surprisingly difficult. I think I've gone round it in about 196 or something like that strokes. So, you know, that's that's your challenge to beat. The town itself is a real mix of town and gown and visitors as well and the golfers they have just had the 150th open golf championship in st andrews the town was absolutely just madly busy for that this week it's busy but for another reason and that's because the Lammas fair which is one of the traveling fairs that goes around scotland is in town and i was there last saturday with gareth halliday actually we were doing a, a book event in waterstones and the Lammas Fair was just setting up, but um, the, it, it, was, it will be much more extensive now. Um, I'm thinking probably by this stage you're getting a bit tired, so you might want to pick yourselves up um, an ice cream from one of the two uh, Italian ice cream shops, Ginetta's or Luvian's, a beer from the St Andrew's Brewing Company, and to keep you going on your journey up towards Aberdeen, a fudge donut from Fisher and Donaldson. I've just had one and it was very, very nice. <laughs> so I need to climb on board the bus again, Emma. I'm full of food and I've done all my walking around St Andrews. Just all sounds a wee bit too nice though, Marion. So is there ever a murder in St Andrews? I couldn't possibly comment. <laughs> I have to say that having just written my seventh book set in St Andrews, I'm running out of places to kill people. So I'm open to suggestions. I'll take nominations um, for a small consideration. <laughs> so it's the, I mean, what, what makes it, what, what was it? I mean, obviously it's a beautiful setting and, yeah. you, know, and, you, and you, you bring it to life so beautifully in your books. What was it, that, was that the reason you wanted to, to, did you want to scratch the surface and see the dark side of it? I mean, why is it such a great setting for your crime books? I think it's a great setting. I, I think of it as, as like a mini Oxford because it has the visitors and the student, the international students and academics as well. And it also has the ancient buildings. And so having been a fan of Morse and Inspector Morse novels, I thought St Andrews was crying out for a similar kind of treatment. Um, 
But, you know, it's like any town. It looks lovely and it's it's very beautiful, but scratch beneath the surface and all human life is there. Mm. So I think you can set crime novels anywhere, really. But um, I love the different aspects of the town. There's there's different kinds of people coming through it and kind of meeting and uh, colliding and so on. Mm. Lots Absolutely. of scope. I think when we get back on the bus, we're going to be heading up to Aberdeen. And I feel like Aberdeen, you know, has has that grittier image, doesn't it? I think. I mean, I went to university there, I worked as a news reporter there, worked on many, many murders as we're heading up the coast. We can't see anything because the har has come in. The har, for those of you who haven't been to the northeast, it's just a big, massive cloud that comes in off the sea and sits on top of Donald Trump's golf course most of the year, uh, which is delightful. Um, and it makes everything really cold and a bit grey. And it's it, obviously we've got Stuart McBride is, is is probably the most famous um, crime writer to come out of Aberdeen. But we have the mighty Deborah Masson, who sadly can't be with us tonight. Uh, but Marion was going to step in and talk a wee bit about why Aberdeen makes such a great setting for crime novels as well, up there in the northeast corner of Scotland. It, uh, the first thing I'm going to say about Aberdeen, and Deborah will will argue this, but she's not here to argue, so you know I'm going to say it anyway. It's freezing. <laughs> Aberdeen sits out on what I would call the shoulder of Scotland, not not quite at the the sort of corner, but that that northeast shoulder, um, and it takes the full force of the the North Sea winds. Um, it's been for many decades now the oil capital of Europe, uh, being a kind of stopping place for uh, or, or a place where the rig workers will go. They'll um, catch a helicopter to go out to the various North Sea installations and they, you can train for your kind of undersea survival and things like that up there as well. And there's lots of oil companies have their headquarters in Aberdeen. So it has at one time um, Dundee was Scotland's largest city in terms of uh, population. But Aberdeen, when the oil boom happened, took over and it's now the third largest city in, in Scotland. It does sit out on the North Sea, but it's it's also a place that's known as where the, the Don and the Dee meet the North Sea, the Don and the Dee being the two rivers. Um, when, you, when we're driving up to Aberdeen, I would suggest that we take the coastal route tour guide um, because you can nice. stop at you know, lovely kind of um, little villages. A favourite of mine is Catterline, which is where the Scottish painter Joan Erdley lived and, and did lots of painting um, and it's also got very good fish and chips oh the cattle like the, the the hotel the pub there is just amazing so but um don't ever go when i'm going because i want to make sure i get a table okay um so we approach aberdeen from the south um and the d is the first river that you cross d-e-e -E, and when you're leaving aberdeen at the north you cross the dawn um it's a busy town it's built of granite which lends itself to um, kind of gritty and dark. But, you know, being further north, obviously in the winter, it has less light than we might have down at kind of St Andrews and Edinburgh. It gets darker quicker. And I think that darkness and the grey, grey granite can give it a kind of um, austere look. And that perhaps makes it perfect mm -hmm. for crime fiction. Having said that, the granite is very beautiful and there's a lovely building called Marischal College, which is built in the Gothic Revival style and it's just utterly stunning, really beautiful. It has to be seen. You, you walk up the, the street and suddenly you think, my word, this is quite something. So Marischal College, it's worth seeing. And then with, within a mile or so of the Gothic splendour, there's actually, within Aberdeen itself, a tiny little fishing village called Foot D, F-O-O-T-D-E-E, -E, because it's at the foot of the D, but the locals call it Fitty. Fitty. Okay. And this was built for the um, for the, uh, the fishing work, fisher folk. And they did a very clever thing with Fitty. Um, they built all the houses kind of in a square, I would, you know, like, like, four sides um, and they all face inwards so that they were protected from the, the gales that come in off the, the North Sea um, so they didn't get the worst of the weather. It's an incredibly clever idea and something that was quite ahead of its time then. Um, I think it's now uh, listed and protected and it's the quaint little thing. It's like you know, I spoke as we came up from Edinburgh about um, the East Nuke fishing villages. Well, this is like the East Nuke in miniature. 
absolutely charming, really, really lovely. And of course, Aberdeen um, is very uh, popular with crime fiction readers because it has its festival called Granite Noir in February every year, and it attracts some really big names uh, to it. Um, so that is worth putting in your, your calendar. So if you've walked around Aberdeen, you've had a look at the beach. There's a lovely, lovely beach with a promenade. You've walked around Fitty and had a look at that. You've gone to see Marischal College. You'll be getting a bit puggled now. Good Scots word, puggled. So I would suggest that you find yourself a bakery and buy a rowie to keep you going on the next leg of your tour. And a rowie, also known as a buttery, is a kind of flattish roll that's it's got so much butter in it that I, I think they were originally made, someone will tell, correct me on this, but I think they were originally to kind of keep um, keep the, the fisher folk uh, sustained because oh, they're really fatty. Yeah, it's pretty to for sure. Salty as well. Um, you'll, you'll certainly need another pint of the St Andrews Brewery, uh, St Andrews Beer Company, Brewing Company beer after you've had a rowie. But I think if you take your rowie and you no crumbs on the bus, obviously, we don't want to make a mess. So um, just be careful about that. Get back on the bus. And we're about to say cheerio to Aberdeen. We're going to go head over the, the River Don, over Bridge of Don, and up towards, let, let's take the scenic route. Let's let's head up towards Inverness, taking in some of the the area that you used to work in, um, towards Elgin and so on. Hi. Yeah, so I mean, I think I wonder. I'm just wondering if there's ever been a death by by buttery or murder by buttery. It's maybe a, a, a way that bakers secretly murdered people they didn't like was feed them up in butteries and get a guarantee of a heart attack within about two and a half years. Um, I'm using you might, that you might say you might say that they've been butteried up. Oh, oh, you oh I love that, right. Thank you. Don't Thank give you. up the day job. <laughs> so I, I actually worked as a crime reporter in Aberdeen uh, and then again up on the road out of Aberdeen towards Inverness and, and it is a beautiful part of the country, big skies, big open skies, cold as hell but amazing blue skies and, and a lot of space. It's so cold. Um, aye, it's, 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 it's not a warm place and that does add to this sort of creepiness because you find yeah. that you're, you're hunched, you've got your hood up and um, there's a lot of sort of dark corners and also in Aberdeen you've got that amazing contrast between the really wealthy oil people and then the students and then you've got a lot of areas you know poverty and such like and um, my first ever murder in Aberdeen was a double murder uh, on the top you've been floor murdering of people uh, no, it wasn't my. I was covering it as a news reporter. Um, you weren't responsible I'm, for it. I wasn't. I wasn't. I was responsible for probably quite a few mistakes in the article that followed, but <laughs> we won't talk about that. Um, but there is that, um, again, that contrast, I think, in Scotland where you've got, well, often I, th I feel like the places, um, you know, the, 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 the the country itself, the city itself, the towns and villages really become such an important part, I think, of the stories in crime fiction. So we've had the wee towns and villages, we've got this big city with the cosmopolitan vibe, and then moving up to the Highlands, you know, if, if you haven't been to the Highlands, I mean, it's the most spectacular place. Again, wide open spaces, small communities, big mountains, trees, all these sort of dark little lanes without street lights. Gareth Halliday with a cat on his shoulder. <laughs> Uh, why, why set your books there, guys? What is it about the Highlands that makes it such a good setting for crime fiction? For me, um, I just kind of love that um, balance you have between the like the centre of Inverness, which is quite urban, and then all, all this landscape around it, which feels like kind of really wild. So I feel like that works really well as this kind of balance almost like between good and evil if that makes sense um, it's what we kind of love in crime fiction is the idea of like goodness and evil um, balanced together so yeah i think that's what draws me to it. and you're, you're breaking up a wee bit from i'm not sure if that's you or whether it's me um but so you because the highlands are you know it's, it's not just um it's not just one wee corner of Scotland is a vast area. So how do you choose, you know, you do a lot of hiking, you do a lot of outdoor mm. stuff. Are you sort of out hiking and you say, oh, this would be a great place to find a body? Or how, how do you how do you choose your settings? Yeah, like I never kind of set out to um, write a detective series based in the Highlands, but I was kind of like writing a novel and 
I was over on the west coast near Gerloch and um, you know, DI Monica Kennedy just kind of emerged to solve a crime over there and uh, she kind of took over the, the story and Inverness ended up being the main backdrop for the series and Under the Marsh is the third novel in the series uh, which is set in Inverness. And you also have a camper van in your stories as well, don't you? I love a camper van in my stories. And I know that's <laughs> intimidated you a lot over the years. So. <laughs> um, there's, no, there's no killers in this camper van, I don't think. Um, <laughs> although we did have a strange knock at the door last night. And then we saw two people. Anyway, that's not, it was a bit scary. We were sleeping beside a graveyard last night because there's always a flat car park and they're always in flat areas. It's a very good location to sleep with a camper van. Top tip uh, in your, if you're in a camper van your way around Europe. But we're not going to stop in the graveyard near, near the, uh, any of our crime writing um, scenes because that would be a bit too scary. But um, let's whiz down the road a wee bit. Um, we're still we're still in the Highlands, but we're not quite as as, as north as Gareth. We're going to stop off with Andrew Gregg. He's going to take over the mic and tell us about his settings and his locations and why he finds them so inspiring for his brilliant stories. Andrew Gregg, take over the mic. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, Fort William, uh, not that far down the the road from there. Uh, on the shores of Loch Linney, the, one of the, the longest uh, and narrowest sea lochs in Scotland. Uh, obviously home to uh, the highest mountain in the, in the country, uh, Ben Nevis. Um, and it's about 10,000 people, I think, uh, the last census. Just about 10,500 people live there. So plenty of people to kill, which is uh, a big advantage. Uh, and similar to Gareth, I guess, um, I've chosen it because it's got the, the wide open spaces all around it. Um, so lots of potential for, for getting out in the, the wilds and, uh, and getting up to all sorts of mayhem uh, and outside the, the realm of uh, ready mobile phone coverage and all that sort of thing, which, which I find helps uh, give a sense of isolation and, uh, uh, you know, adds to the kind of whole gothic uh, experience of, uh, of murders up in that part of the world. Uh, there's been a few messages pop down. I don't know if anyone gets these on their, their page um on the uh on the, the stream here uh someone has asked um uh have you ever acted out a scene you were writing um which is a, is a very good question uh and the answer to that for me is no uh but i did stab myself with a chicken when i was um spatulating it only the other week uh and one of its bones went right into my finger um so i, I had um i had a, a very deep penetration if i'm allowed to say that sort of thing on the uk uh crime club uh, by a piece of raw chicken, which hasn't done me any harm yet, <laughs> as far as I know. <laughs> Still think I'm perfectly normal. Um, and there was something else. Oh, Gareth's cat rules the roost. Uh, unfortunately, Gareth uh, has frozen on my screen, so uh, I did wonder if they're talking about his hair. But I, I guess there is a there is a cat there somewhere, uh, although I can't see it. Um, yeah, so that's that's basically uh, that's basically it. I mean, there's loads of twaddle I could talk about Fort William, but um, it's uh, I, I kind of fell in love with the place when I went up there as a very young uh, lad of 18, um, uh, purely because a lorry driver dropped me there <laughs> after about two days of constant hitchhiking uh, from the depths of Wales. Um, and I stayed there for a, a wee while working for the Forestry Commission and uh, generally chopping down trees and being a lumberjack. And uh, it was absolutely great fun. And that's kind of stayed with me. So that's, that's why I have that sort of... Uh, that's why I selected it. I also naively thought there weren't any other crime writers uh, writing about Fort William. And then, of course, I discovered the J.D. Kirk uh, books. <laughs> so sorry, J.D. Kirk, if you're, if you're watching. I didn't even know you existed uh, when I started writing those. So um, apologies for hogging your turf. Uh, yeah, so there you go. Uh, that's basically me coming to the end of my, my, uh, my little segment. Um, throwing, the mic, throwing the mic back. What should we eat while we're in, before we get back on the bus? What should we eat? Yeah, we, well, there, we have there a bit of the, the, your yeah, chicken. The, you can, I wouldn't. Uh, it wasn't very nice, actually. Um, <laughs> the, there was a place called McTav McTavish's Kitchen in, in Fort William when I was there, uh, and I wouldn't have eaten there either. I, I think it's, uh, I think health and safety closed it down, to be honest. Um, 
I don't know about places to eat, but there's a very good bookshop, the Highland Bookshop. I've got I've got to uh, give them a shout out because uh, a they had my book on the, or books on the shelf, and uh, b it's a really good shop. So um, never mind the food, just go, just go to the bookshop, buy lots of books. Uh, but if you're really interested in the area, it's it's been used a lot for for films. So obviously the Harry Potter uh, viaduct out of Glenfin and to the west uh, features a lot. Um, Braveheart, um, obviously, um, goodness me, Highlander. Uh, you know, they're, they're all they're all filmed up the Port William area. So uh, lots of sites that you'd recognise if you went up there. But yeah, Excellent. I'm uh, I'm jumping back on the uh, onto the tour bus now. Um, without anything to eat at all, although they, uh, I did used to like the floury breaded rolls uh, with very cheap cheese in, um, which was a staple of my diet because they pay absolute bugger all the Scottish Forest Division. Well, they did. I imagine it's still the case, uh, unless you're <laughs> a high engine in the uh, in the organisation. And uh, I'll pass you back to Emma. And I'll definitely trust you, with Jane. So that's the the model of that story. <laughs> I didn't. Um, I didn't get that far. <laughs> <laughs> I left before I got the chainsaw. Unfortunately. <laughs> um, now, before we before we head, head down the road to Oban, um, the, the, I will pass that question around the bus. Since we've got no food, we'll, we'll pass the question around. Has anyone ever acted out a scene from their book? And if so, which scene? Oh, Mar Marion's nodding. There's a nod from Marion. Which one did you act out? Dare I ask? There's a scene in my third book, Lies to Tell, which is just over my shoulder, where um, a character is tied to a chair, hands behind a chair. And I needed to work out how um, I needed the person down on the floor for reasons I won't go into. And I needed to work out what would happen if you rocked the chair and went right back. Mm -hmm. um, so I didn't do that. But what I did was I got the chair down and I got down and, and sort of put my arms behind it and worked out which boards I would have broken and um, what I could then have done. And it's surprisingly difficult to tip a chair. Really difficult. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's that's the scene that I acted out. Did you manage to do it in the end? I didn't actually tip the chair because I thought I'll break my arms if I do that. Mm. But um, I, I sort of took it far enough so I could see. And then what I needed to do was once I was on my back, I needed to get over to the side. That's pretty difficult. Try that one without your hands tied, obviously. Just try it without using your arms. It's very hard. <laughs> Um, so if you go to Andy's house, you're going to get a uh, face with a chainsaw. You go to Marion's house, you're going to get tied to a chair and knocked over. Anyone else? No. You won't. There, there, there isn't. There isn't any furniture in my house at the moment. We are made move, so, so come on round. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's continue with the uh, continue with the journey. We do have another question, but we'll come back to that one later. Um, down towards one of my, my favourite towns, the one that a classic on the tourist route. It's Oban, and in Oban we're going to meet Alan Martin. He's going to tell us about the detective with the best name in the industry, I think, and uh, why you chose Oban as a setting for your Angus Blue novels. Alan Martin. Thank you very much, Emma. Um, yes, Angus Blue is a, a, a typical product of the Highlands. Um, I should explain the name, and that is that when the Highlanders in the 19th century were coming down to the lowlands looking for work, uh, having to be integrated into the, the, the bureaucracy of the south, uh, very often uh, somebody, uh, part of the bureaucracy with a clipboard perhaps, uh, would say to the Highlander who is applying for the job, uh, uh, what's your name then? And they would say, oh, my name is Mahanyesh. And of course, they found it very difficult to write that down, particularly if the speaker couldn't actually spell it out for them. So very often, in order to make things easier for themselves, the Highlanders took simple names like brown or blue, uh, black and white and so on. So that's the origin of the name. It's, uh, it's not because Angus Blue has any particular blueness about him. Um, in fact, he's usually quite upbeat uh, when he's investigating. Uh, but um, uh, that's the reason where the name comes from. And he lives in Oban because Oban is a fantastic place to be. Uh, it's on the West Coast. It's the end of the West Highland Line, which is one of the most beautiful uh, train lines in the world. Um, and it's the gateway to the islands. From Oban, you can get to Isla, to Jura, to Mull, to egg, to muck, to rum, to Canada, 
Canada. What am I talking about? Canada, I mean, um, to Cole and Tyree. And I don't know, these ferry Colin drivers theory. don't know what they're doing half the time. <laughs> the Colency, which is where my own family came from in the middle of the 19th century. So it's a great meeting place. Uh, it's a There's a wonderful harbour, um, people coming and going, fishing, tourism, uh, all sorts of things going on. Fantastic place. And of course, all of these things mean that there can be crimes, there can be murders. For instance, uh, in the latest book, The, the Dead of Appin, uh, you hear some investigation into free ports, which people are talking about right at the moment, uh, and some not, not nice things about them. But we'll pass on that, um, because open, fantastic place. It quite often rains, by the way, but I wouldn't worry about that too much. Absolutely not. Oh, my goodness. I, I think uh, Jonathan had just nipped off for a pee, but he's back on the bus now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> did, you, did you have to pay, Jonathan? Was it one of those ones you have to pay 20p? I can't hear. He's stunned. He's stunned at the silence. Yeah. Um, great. And, and uh, Alan, just before we move on, um, we, we, you know, would Angus, would Angus Blue ever move? What would happen if Angus, if Angus Blue moved to like, he would find it very difficult because he lives in a, a house which belonged to his great aunt in Connell, overlooking the bridge, the Connell Bridge. Um, he would find it very difficult. To, uh, the thing would be, that I think, that if he did move somewhere else, he would always keep that house so that he could always return to it. And of course, he would be frequently called back by the police in Oban because of his uh, amazing knowledge of the area and his general uh, ability to solve the more obscure cases, which he does frequently and very successfully. I think Emma's gone. We've lost it. We've lost our tour guide. <laughs> Somebody else has nipped out to the well, um, ladies' room. That's a nightmare. This is a difficult one because both Emma and um, uh, Jonathan have disappeared. So, uh, Marion. I, I can I, can I ask um, Alan, um, can I'm I ask still about here. Can you guys hear me? I can hear, hear you, Gareth. Um, in your books, Alan, there is a lot of whiskey. Oh, yes. And that kind of goes with being on the western coast of Scotland because of all the, the distilleries and the islands and everything. Um, do you think of whiskies? Is that part of your planning when you're planning a book? Ooh. Planning? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Is that a fair word? Do you beg your pardon? I'm afraid I don't plan. I'm afraid I just drink the whiskey and then write the book. Um, so, uh, it, it, but it comes in, of course, because Angus Blue likes whiskey. He, he doesn't. Does. He doesn't drink a lot of it. I have to say, because one glass is always enough to savour, to think about, to let it roll around the mouth, to smell the odours. What's smell Blue's favourite whiskey, Alan? Just Sorry? Just Which is Angus Blue's favourite whiskey? <sighs> That's a question that would be very difficult to answer without annoying lots of distilleries. So I'm, I'm okay. really going to say he has to keep that very quiet. But I will say it's probably from Isla. Isla is the island of whiskey. Uh, it's where the Pete Dead, uh, my first novel, was set. And... Uh, there's about 15 distilleries there now. There's a new one every year. Um, it's certainly worth a visit. If you like your whiskey, go to Isla, visit the distilleries. Not necessarily all of them, but at least enough to get a flavour because they're all very different, all very different. And that's why Absolutely. Angus has to, has to savour the one, to savour the other, to think of the smokiness, the non-smoking, the heaviness. And this is the thing about Isla whiskey. It's got a heaviness that the mm. lesser whiskies from Speyside um, don't possess. Anyway, I mustn't go on about this. So th that's my contribution to the eating and drinking aspect, I think. So you're definitely a West Coast whiskey man. Rather oh, than... yes, I think so. Yes, I would say so. We're a Speyside. Oh, well, I have to say the Orkney whiskey is quite good. Mm -hmm. The Orkney whiskey? Orkney. Orkney. There's a distillery in Orkney and, and their whiskey is very good. Oh, our guide is back. So yeah, sorry. Let's, let's go back to our guide. I, I had to pause and go and try and find Jonathan because he, he went, <laughs> oh, I found him in a pub, face down, <laughs> vomiting. 
I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, so I've, I've made him clean himself up before he gets back on the bus. Um, sorry. <laughs> where, where did we get to? Uh, sorry. We were still in Oban. We should... Well, we're about to leave Oban. I think we've uh, we've it's worth visiting the distillery in Oban too. Actually, they have a nice a nice distillery. The fourteen year old Oban is quite a nice dram. So um, on that point, I'll hand you back to Emma. Well, we're certainly not handing back to Jonathan if there's whiskey involved. <laughs> um, he's been drinking in the bus; it's not allowed. So let's uh, <laughs> let's skip Glasgow for the moment, and we can we can take a wee we'll take a wee detour. We'll head back to Edinburgh first of all, uh, to Portobello, um, which is where my tales are set. So I have to confess, I've written two novels, two and a half novels that are set in Portobello. Uh, but until about five years ago, I didn't even know Portobello existed. I'd lived in Edinburgh, I'd visited Edinburgh, I'd worked in Edinburgh, and I'd never, ever been told or become aware of the fact that there's a big, massive golden beach at the edge of Edinburgh and a wee community called Portobello. And I found out about it because I was I offered to... Um, pet sit for a friend of mine who was going on holiday. She's got two hamsters. Uh, rest in peace, those blessed beasts are now gone. But at that time, they were still alive. So she left me with a handful of cabbage and two hamsters and said, you know, look after these. It's fine, easy job. Um, my first day, I stepped out of the house, turned right and saw the sea at the bottom of the street. And I thought, hang on, I'm in Edinburgh. And I walked down and found myself on this beautiful promenade in, in Portobello and just massive skies. I'm a big fan of big skies. Golden sand. There was dog walkers. There was school kids. There was crazy swimmers swimming in cold water with wheelie hats on. And I just thought, I love this place. I'd been living abroad for about seven years and writing novels based in Guatemala, based in Mexico, based in Nicaragua, which was all the places I was living in. And I was a bit frustrated. I hadn't managed to get a book deal People said, we can't relate to these characters in Guatemala, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Kept getting knocked back. And I turned up, my agent said, oh, how about set one in Scotland? And I was like, well, but all the good places have been taken because Marion's got St. Andrews and Garrett's got <laughs> Highlands and Andy's got Fort William and Alan's got Open. And there's no, there's no places left until I walked out onto Portobello, having not read jo Doug Johnson's books because he's from there. But... Um, I thought this is where I'm going to set my book because it was such a surprise to me. And I think a surprise to so many people. And it's got everything Portobello because it's a really tiny community on the edge of a big city. Um, it's got lots of interesting characters there. You've got, and just the, this sort of contrast of the mountain, Arthur's seat behind you in the distance, the city in the middle, and then you've got the sea and the sky. And it's just, it's just a brilliant place um, to live. And it's a brilliant place to, to set my books. I love um, sort of trying to bring that to life, that, that sort of passion and excitement that, that I still feel about Portobello. And I think also I, I like, my, my books are not a series, um, but I do have a few sort of cameo characters and crossovers um, of one character from novel to the next. Um, and, and Portobello does allow for that to happen. It's you're quite realistic that, you know, if, if, if you see someone in a shop, you, know, you might not see them again for a year and a half, but then you might bump into them down the pub a, a few days later, or whatever. So I like that sort of. No, it's not. Too, it's not a close knit community. Mm. You don't know what everyone's doing, but you do see the same faces, um, and I like being able to do that and sort of bring people in now. And, and of course, being next to a big city like Edinburgh, the capital of Scotland, there is plenty of scope for crime as well. You know, you've got all the, the great crime mm. writers, Ian Rankin. Uh, all, all the big names have set their books in Edinburgh. And it's a city, again, that has such, you know, historically for hundreds of years has been has been used for the backdrop of, of drama. Um, and anyone who has visited Edinburgh, you'll know that the, the main uh, street, Royal Mile, has all these tiny, dark alleyways leading off them, which are called closes. And they're just made for crime novels. They're made for crimes and they're made for crime novels. It's absolutely ideal. And so my first novel, The Silent Daughter, uh, the main action took place in one of these closes, which has got the best name ever, Flesh Market Close. It used to be a butcher there. Um, and my second novel didn't have so much on Edinburgh city centre itself, but it was much more about Portobello. And then I stretched up into the Highlands because the great thing about Edinburgh as well is that, well, in fact, the great thing about Scotland is that no matter where you set your book, you're never really that far from anywhere. <laughs> you know, it's not that big. Uh, the roads aren't great sometimes, but um, I just find 
you know, I, I'd always kind of thought because I travel a lot, I'm traveling at the moment, I'm in Slovenia, I've lived all over the world at different points in my life. And I've always had thought that I wanted to set my books in these faraway places. But in fact, once I started writing my novels back home, I found that that was where I really felt most at ease and mm. most excited. And maybe it's because I live abroad. I love bringing Scotland to life yeah. through my books. Um, and also, I just, you know, I, I did work as a crime reporter in Scotland. I worked in the courts. Mm. Um, and I know what goes on behind the, the postcard scenes in Scotland, mm. you know, and, and um, it's, it's, it's just a brilliant setting um, for for books and Portobello is, is really close to my heart. So for, for, for the book I'm working on at the moment and the next one, um, my book, my fourth book will definitely be set in Portobello as well and long may it continue and if you haven't been to Edinburgh um, why not and if you have been to Edinburgh and haven't been to Portobello take the number 26 bus from the centre and it takes you down into Portobello and guess who's the protagonist of my next book the driver of the number 26 bus so um, yeah so you, you might see me on there doing some research and in fact we've got the question about have you ever acted out a scene well when i sit on the every time i go to, to portobello i take the number 26 bus and i'm always fascinated about the lives that come on buses and then leave and all these all these hundreds of stories that are mixed together for brief moments and then separated again i just find that aspect of of bus life very 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 interesting and i've worked on buses for years because i'm a tour guide as well um so yeah buses are, are close to my heart as well and i'm in a little van at the moment not quite bus size but um but yeah it's, it's scotland in general i think just has has such a, a, a massive array of possibilities now we are missing jonathan whitelaw of course who's set who's based in glasgow um but his books in fact are set surprisingly south of the border um, in a wee place called Penrith. Now, if any of you have been up to Scotland on the train, uh, you will actually have probably been through Penrith Station. It is just in North Yorkshire, I believe. Um, yes, there's some nodding. My, yeah. English, my English geography is terrible. But it's in the Lake District. And uh, I know Jonathan um, has fond memories of many, many holidays in the Lake District. And his book, The Bingo Hall Detectives, is, is set there. And it's got this, this cosy feeling, the backdrop of the lakes, which is beautiful, and these lovely, beautiful wee towns. And he very cleverly and, and humorously exposes uh, the darker side of life with the with the bingo hall detectives available now in all good bookshops. Um, and uh, so Jonathan's still banned from the bus. I'm sorry, but he's, he's got to go and find a good t-shirt. Um, but we've got... Emma, some... Emma can, I, can I ask you a question now? Of course. Um, why did you decide not to write a series, but to, to produce a set of standalones set in the same place? It wasn't really a decision, to be honest, Alan. I just, I, when I wrote my first book, I, I realised I loved writing about Portobello. Um, and I, I think it's maybe just a place that's so close to my heart. And and, and I suppose the characters I wrote about in, in the first story, in The Silent Daughter, um, their story, the protagonist's story, really came to mm. a conclusion that, that I didn't feel it needed to we go any further with it. But... Um, the sort of people who moved that story, so one of the news reporters and the policewoman, um, yeah. I felt that I, I really, I did, I would like to see them again, but I'm not seeing the book through their eyes. So my books are always through the eyes of of, of the of the person who the thing is happening to, I suppose. Mm. Um, and yeah. so I, my police character and my um, my news my newspaper reporters will sort of come in and out. <laughs> Um, so, I mean, people I have had arguments with Trevor Wood, uh, a Newcastle crime writer. He says that my books are a series because they're based in the same place and they feature some of the same characters. But I would argue that it's, it's not quite because the protagonist is, is never uh, mm -hmm. the same. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it wasn't really a deliberate decision. I just kind of, um, I love featuring yeah. Montebello. I suppose. Yeah. I, I would argue. I would argue that your books are almost on the edge of the crime genre and and moving into something bigger because it the focus is often not on the crime but on the the relationships between the people and some event which is not a crime but is is very significant as a life event that that gradually evolves in, into our knowledge. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, I think mine under the crime umbrella. Um, mm. Mine are. My I think they're edging to the ed edging towards the edge of the umbrella. <laughs> it's a very big umbrella, though. It's a very big umbrella. <laughs> I mean, it's a huge umbrella. Umbrella. That's the thing about crime. That's the great thing about crime fiction. It, it, you know, it, I think, and that, that's why I love like festivals like Harrogate and mm. Bloody yeah. Scotland and 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 um, uh, all the noir festivals at all the different locations. I think that I was quite surprised to find that under crime fiction, you've got historical, you've got psychological, mm -hmm. you know, um, psychological thrillers, uh, as mine is classed as, or domestic thriller. Um, you know, and I think that's one of the one of the great things about crime fiction yeah. there is that there is room for all for all these different kinds of stories um yeah. you know and crime touches touches different people in completely different ways you know and, and i think as a news reporter i was always very fascinated by the what happens next what happened to this person who i saw crying in court um yeah. because their granny you know did something and they, our granny get put did away did you ever you know, do follow-up stories and those kind of people in your work as a journalist or was it kind of always on to the next things well, well uh, kind of i mean i was quite good at following up but often you, you follow up with with the victims um mm. you don't necessarily follow up with with the perpetrators and you certainly don't tend to speak to their families um mm. you know and and that's a, it's a funny thing in journalism you know when there's a, a murder or some sort of horrible crime you, all, you you know you speak to the family of the the bereaved or, or or the victims um but very very rarely do you do you speak to the family or get any insight into the family of of, of, of the people who have committed crimes and i think mm -hmm. and that, that's it's quite an interesting one for me to sort of look at um just look at take the crime and look at a sort of bigger a bigger zoom out a bit i suppose and and, and have a bigger a bigger um picture on the whole thing yeah, um, talking about coming back to stories, uh, you walked out of your flat in Portobello with two very healthy, happy hamsters uh, to discover this beach, <laughs> and uh, and then they were dead. What 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 happened? In the, <laughs> what happened there? The reader wants to know. <laughs> it, they, they died several years later. I have to say, um, it was oh, nothing right. yeah. nothing to do with the cabbage. Was it, wasn't your tender care? <laughs> no. Um, they ble blessed them. Um, no, I fed them the regulated amount of cabbage every day and took them out and changed the sawdust and all sorts of things. I was, I was very caring, very, right. very caring. Um, now, just just in, in case any readers are worried, you know. <laughs> if there's any hamsters in my books, I don't think there will be hamsters in my books. Um, is there not? Was there not? Oh, no, forget, I was going to go off on a tangent there. Um, now, we've got a question on the chat from Lindsay Lynn, who's asking how we formed... The collective. Um, mm. I feel like I've been speaking for a long time. Does anyone want to answer that? Gareth, you've made a, a humming noise. Yeah, so like my experience of the collective forming was amazing. It was, you know, we hear so much negativity about social media and, mm. you know, Lord knows it can kind of suck us down dark holes of like drawing our attention for hours on end. But this was one of the experiences of social media that was brilliant, which was a random message from Emma Christie in my um, Instagram just kind of been a lot on. We ended up kind of chatting about um, the world of Scottish crime because Emma was, you were in Barcelona at the time, weren't you? Mm. And so Emma was kind of just, I think she'd come to realize that she'd been writing books about Scotland, but she was kind of, she didn't actually know any Scottish crime writers. So somehow we ended up, you know, becoming friends via Instagram. And she said she was, you know, kind of trying to like bring together some kind of collective, and um, I think I just kind of maybe give you some contacts of some people I thought might be helpful, and then you kind of went off. And sorry, I've got a cat here who keeps trying to get the attention. <laughs> and this is Minnie, by the way, got the savage and um, complete attention uh, seeker. And yeah, so that was my experience was Emma kind of just reaching out and then and that, and that was so nice. Like, and then... Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. I, I, I just peaked as a crime writer with my uh, McElvinny shortlist thing. <laughs> 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 it's all downhill from then on. Uh, and, uh, and Emma contacted me. And uh, yeah, it was great. It's, it's really nice to have a, a bunch of like-minded people yeah. that uh, uh, 
more maybe so because it's a lonely it's a lonely business writing mm. uh it's you and your you know an empty screen sort of thing and uh, it's quite nice to be able to just socially interact uh through whatsapp or whatever sometimes uh, as yeah. we tend to do uh just to yeah. bounce off each other and you know and things like this are great uh, to be able to you know all come together and and chat a load of nonsense to, uh, that hopefully some some people are enjoying uh yeah so very positive experience i second that yeah I, I would say it's 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 one of the other things is that we're able to to look at each other's books before they're published and you know give endorsements or make suggestions or tell them it's rubbish who knows <laughs> And I have to say, I, do that. I, I know a lot of the um, the UK Crime Club um, viewers are, are big fans of Trevor Wood and the Northern Crime Collective. And it was, in fact, uh, it was Trevor Trevor's group that, that inspired me to try and set something mm. up in, in Scotland because I, I love the Northern yeah. Crime Collective. And, uh, you know, the, um, yeah, I, I spoke to, to Trevor and said, how did, how did you, how did you, how did it all work, you know? And uh, he sort of gave me a few names, gave me a few ideas, and 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 you know, very quickly we, we found each other, and yeah, it's been it's been a super positive experience for me, and, and hopefully for everyone else as well. Uh, oh, yeah. and Sam is telling us that the Northern Crime yes. um, Syndicate are on next week, Syndicate. and they're a brilliant, hey. brilliant, a brilliant bunch. Mm. Uh, so definitely worth checking them out as well. And special thanks to Trevor Woods. Now, this, Trevor Woods, I always call him Woods, and he gets very annoyed. <laughs> Um, I, it's sad to say I don't think JD Jonathan Whitelaw is going to be able to join mm. us. Um, he's still a uh, lock in an ambulance, locked in the bathroom, <laughs> locked in the bathroom. The <laughs> we dumped him at the side of a road. He's uh, I don't think he's even got money for a taxi, but he'll make it, he'll make it. Um, but um, so we've only got a few minutes left. If you do have any other questions, then pop them in the chat. But in the meantime, um hope you've you, you've had a, a I hope you've enjoyed this this tour of Scotland but we'll do a wee zoom around all the places that we've been and all the the people that we've spoken to we've spoken to Mary and Todd in St Andrews the beautiful St Andrews we've spoken to Andy Gregg in Fort William Are you holding up your book Andy uh, uh yes <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. That's the latest one, A Song of Winter. It's a good um, one. It's a good one. It's um, Thank you, Alan. Very Alan Martin and Oban with Angus the dead of We've got Gareth Halliday in Inverness-ish with Under the Marsh. We had Deborah Masson, who's, whose uh, publication day was yesterday for her third novel, uh, Under um, the Oops. Ashes. Under the, from under the, the bus. So under the bus. <laughs> under, the <bus. laughs> under the ashes sorry that was your fault Darren. <laughs> the fire book the book about burning the burn last the thing ashes. the last thing to burn <laughs> no, the burning book from the ashes too hot to handle um, mm. uh, long listed for the McIlvany prize mm. I don't I actually do have a copy of my book but it's in the hard to reach cupboard of my camper van so um, so I can't get it if anyone else has got it flash it at the screen um, but Thank you so much to the UK um, Crime Club um, for having us uh, on oh, the tour bus. Sorry. Oh, there we go. There's my book, The Silent Daughter, my debut, based in Portobello. Oh, there was another wee question come in, actually, um, saying, have I ever felt like turning, returning to any of the characters? Well, yes, because you know what? I, 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 I do always kind of wonder what happens next with my mm. characters as well. Um, but I do also think I know when I've, when I've presented the sort of most important story of their lives and that's maybe just time to let them get on with it uh, um, yeah. but they, they but they do they do stay with me definitely um as will dave the bus driver um <laughs> when, when i finally get that one written um but thank you so much to sam and all the other um uk yeah. crime club crew thanks everyone who's watched thanks for all the questions and hopefully you've got a a, a, bit, a better picture of what scotland's like and also the diversity of scottish crime fiction if you want a wee holiday um on on a page then you've got it with uh, with some of the books from the caledonia crime collective check us out we are on facebook we are on twitter we're not yet on instagram and um, but we individually we all are so please follow us and happy reading thanks again to sam Thank and take care to everyone at home Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.